All right, folks, uh, Mr. Reed here. Uh, the last thing that we covered together was the inverse trig derivative. And I'm going to try to put together some videos that you may wish to follow along. Uh, just remember, since it's a video, uh, feel free to pause at any time. I'm going to kind of go through the material a little bit faster than I normally would because you do have the ability to pause or go back and watch it again. Um, so I uh, we'll, won't be asking you for your input or questions as we go through it, um, but I'll, uh, I'll try to put it together and see if it's something that can be useful to you. Uh, so the last thing that we were covering was this inverse trig derivative. Uh, we had done some derivations in class for all six of them. Uh, and so now I'm just going to do some questions that involve using these inverse trig derivatives and see how it goes. Uh, so the first part is pretty straightforward. So we're going to take the function y is equal to the uh, inverse tan of 3x. And so this is a chain rule question. We have an outer function that is the inverse tan, and we have an inner function that is 3x. Pretty straightforward. We're just going to apply chain rule. And the derivative in this case is going to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. However, x in this case is not just a plain x. It's actually because of the chain rule, the argument here is a 3x. So we're going to be taking the derivative that we came up with for the inverse tan function, and we're going to be substituting the inner function into that variable position. So it becomes 3x all squared. Um, since we are also applying chain rule here, this is the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside, now times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of 3x is just 3, um, so that's the end of our chain rule, and that's the end of this particular question because there's nothing else to it there. Uh, for the next one, we're going to have y is equal to x squared inverse cosine of 2 divided by x. Now in this particular one, there still is a chain rule going on with the inverse trig function. However, there's also a product rule going on. So if I bring attention to that, we have an x squared part and we have an inverse cosine of 2 over x. So those are my two pieces. I'm going to just start this out because everything's involved in the product by just applying product rule and seeing where it goes. So in this case, the derivative is going to be equal to 2x. I'll take the derivative of the first chunk and I'll leave the second one alone, which is the inverse cosine of 2 divided by x. Uh, now next up, I'm going to finish off my product rule by saying I'm going to add to the first chunk left alone, which is x squared, times the derivative of the next part. Uh, the derivative of the inverse trig function here is actually negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus the argument squared. So it's not just x squared. In this case, our argument is 2 divided by x. So as a little aside, this 2 divided by x that we're talking about right now is actually the same thing as saying 2x to the minus 1. The reason I might bring that up is because 2 divided by x looks a lot like a quotient rule. Well, it is, and you can treat it that way if you want. However, it's a little more cumbersome and not quite as flowing than if you rewrite it as 2x to the minus 1. It's just a simple um, coefficient uh, times the x to the minus 1, which is a power rule. So in this case, if I treat it like a power rule, when I'm finishing off my derivative that I'm in the middle of right now, so second part of the product rule, just did the derivative of the inverse cosine function, which is starting our chain. We left the inside alone, now times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be the derivative of 2x to the minus 1. So I have minus 2x to the negative 2. If you were uh, instead going to attempt that by using a quotient rule, it will end up being the same thing. Uh, it will look a fair bit different. If we took the time to simplify that way and simplify the way that I just did it, uh, we'd get the same thing. Um, I'm not going to bother simplifying for the most part, even though this would simplify really, really nicely. Um, if you want to take a look at, you have an x squared there and we have an x to the minus 2 there. I mean, things are going to look a lot nicer if we actually were to do something. Uh, however, I'm going to leave it alone for now. Uh, so we'll say that this question was take the derivative, but do not simplify. Next up, um, I'm going to do a, a question that revolves more around finding the equation of the tangent line. Uh, so basically the same concept um, we have in this case, uh, y or I guess f of x is what we're saying in this question, is equal to x inverse sine of x over 4 plus the square root 
of 16 minus x squared. Now, um, that's a semicircle. Uh, so looking at top half of a circle there. And so it's also adjusted though um, by this thing right here, uh, which I guess you could think of it as a vertical displacement. However, it's a function, not just a constant. So mm, we'll probably have a little bit of a different look to it. Uh, but we'll, uh, we don't really have to know how it graphs specifically because what we want to do is just find out how steep it is specifically when the x value is 2. So I'm going to do this by first of all finding out what the y value is at that point because once we go to actually uh, do the equation of the tangent line I need to know both the x and the y value. So I'll punch that in uh, by saying the function evaluated at 2 is just going to be 2 the inverse sine of 2 divided by 4 plus 16 minus 2 squared. So um, we'll go ahead and simplify that a little bit. So we get 2 and then the inverse sine of 1 half. Now, technically, the inverse sine function, um, when we came up with it originally, we used sine between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Um, so we are only looking for answers that are in quadrants 4 or 1. Um, because of that, uh, sine is a positive one half, only in quadrant one out of those two. So this is a quadrant one angle that we're going to get. So uh, the inverse sine of a half um, is our 30 degrees or pi over six angle. Uh, if you remember your trigonometry uh, from pre -Cal A. And so in this case, I'm just gonna say pi over six because I don't really wanna mess with degrees and with everything else that's unitless here. Uh, it'd be a lot cleaner to just use radians. So uh, two times pi over six, and then plus the square root of, and then it's 16 minus two squared. So we get square root of 12. I'm just going to uh, tidy it up just a little bit more. So we get pi over three plus, and this is four times three inside the square root. So this is two root three. All right, so that's done. Uh, I'm then going to take uh, this same function and evaluate the derivative for it. So f prime at x is equal to. Now, this is, uh, again, two pieces. So we have the piece before the addition, so and the piece after the addition. This is a sum rule, so we just do the two parts entirely separately. When doing that, this piece over here uh, is actually a product rule itself, so we'll have to spend a little bit of time getting through this. So a product rule, I'm going to take the derivative of the x, it's gone, just a 1 there, so the inverse sine of x over 4 is what's left. And then I'm going to add that to the second part of the product rule, which is to take the derivative of the other piece here. That's 1 over the square root of 1 uh, minus and then the argument squared. Now our argument this time is x over 4. So we left the inside alone. Now times the derivative of the inside, the x over 4 is the same thing as a 1 quarter coefficient times x. They're identical. So if you think about it as 1 quarter times x, it's a really easy derivative. So it's just the uh, constant 1 quarter left over. You can also do it as a quotient rule as well. But that over applying quotient rule is a big waste of time in the long run. So if you can recognize when you don't need it, that's helpful. So next up, uh, we are still doing the square root part of this derivative, and I am going to run out of room there, so I'm just going to drop it below. So this is also plus. The square root is the same thing as a one-half power around the everything that's inside under the radical symbol. So I'll say the one-half has come down. I'll leave the inside alone. Now to the power of minus one-half, because power rule, we subtract one from the exponent. And then we're going to multiply by the derivative in the, of the inside, which is negative 2x. All right, that's great. We technically only need to know what the slope is at x is equal to 2. So we're going to take this derivative that we found, and we're going to specifically evaluate it at um, x is equal to 2. So just like the last time, uh, the first part I might as well write it down. So the first part is the inverse sine of 2 divided by 4. So we'll come across that in a second. That's the same idea. It's the inverse sine of a half, still quadrant 1. We'll get pi over 6 again. Uh, next up, we're going to have 2 times 1 over the square root of 1 minus, and then that's going to be 2 over 4 squared. 
And then I'm also gonna have the one quarter that's there, plus one half, 16 minus two squared to the negative one half power, minus two times two. I should probably put it separately since I've done it everywhere else. All right, so next up, uh, we are going to just tidy this up a little bit and try to get a simplified value as much as we can. So as we said, pi over six for that first expression. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have plus uh, one over, and then we have the two on the front uh, times a quarter is gonna give us a half. So it's gonna be a two down bottom, but also inside of that square root, we're having one minus one half squared. One half squared is a quarter, so it's one minus a quarter is three quarters. And so we would have two in the denominator from the two times a quarter times the square root of three quarters is what's gonna be left over. And I will take a little, um, one more step to tidy that up in a moment. Uh, next up, we're gonna have the uh, one half on the front uh, times the negative four at the end. Uh, so that's gonna give me a negative two up top. Uh, this is now uh, the inside, or the, the negative one half power part can be put as a square root in the denominator. And so that square root uh, is going to be 16 minus four, which is again, 12. And we said earlier that that's the same thing as two root three. Um, so in this particular example, uh, we're going to end up with pi over six plus, uh, and in this, um, this one here, uh, first part, it's gonna be the root of three over four. Uh, That's the same thing as root three over two. And divided by a fraction, same thing as multiplying by a reciprocal. So the twos are actually gonna cancel out there. And I'm gonna get plus one over root three. Uh, the next part is actually, um, it's gonna be a negative. Uh, so it cancels out there and we have negative two divided by two is negative one over root three. I'm kind of lucky here. Uh, things actually worked out really nicely in terms of simplification. So we have a positive and negative, the same constant value, so they go away. So in the end, uh, we actually get that the derivative at that point is pi over six. So we have all the information that we need. We know that the slope is pi over six. Uh, we also know that the point is x of two and a y of this thing right here. So it's pi over three plus two root three. So I'll just uh, take that information, put it down here. So our point is two uh, pi over three plus two root three. Uh, and then the slope value is pi over six. All right, so I'm uh, just gonna go and use this form here of a linear equation. So y minus y1 is equal to the slope value x minus x1. We'll put in our y values, uh, or y value, so that's pi over three plus two root three. And then I'll put in my slope and my x values, my x value, so x minus two. So that's the equation of the tangent line that should cut this thing at x is equal to two. Now, instead of just leaving it there and saying that that's good enough, because it is, but it's hard to tell whether that actually is an appropriate answer or not. Uh, so before we start, um, I decided to graph uh, the uh, x times the inverse sine uh, of x over four ending plus the square root of 16 minus x squared. Uh, so that's what we have sitting over, I guess, there, but uh, <laughs> it's set up opposite on my computer. So uh, if you see me staring off into the abyss, that's why. Uh, so if I take that and instead set this up as that, as well as the linear function that we just came up with. Uh, so that is pi over three uh, plus two square root of three. Um, so that is my left-hand side of the little equation that we just came up with. And if we set that equal to pi over six uh, times x minus two, uh, what we're hoping is that we're going to come up with a tangent line, but not only just a tangent line, it should be the tangent line that specifically takes this thing and cuts it at the point two comma f at two. Um, so the uh, Desmos is pretty smart. So if I uh, 
am lazy and I don't want to type in what the function is at two, um, it will actually do the calculation for me because I've already set up what the function is. So if we uh, take a look here, um, make that a little better. Uh, so we have our original function here and it's this nice curve. Uh, this is the line that we came up with and this specifically is the point where they are going to intersect. It looks like a beautiful tangent line. If we were to focus in here, we would see that it exhibits local linearity. Uh, so great and uh, happens to be at two, which is good because that's what we were supposed to find. Uh, and then it ends up being at about four and a half, a little bit over that, uh, which is uh, it's great. So that seems like it worked out really well and we're done that particular question. Uh, so next up, I'm going to just do this one, which is going to, uh, funny enough, we came up with our inverse trig derivatives by using implicit differentiation. Um, so we're also just gonna solve an implicit differentiation question that has the result of our implicit differentiation in it. Uh, so in this particular uh, example that I'm going to do next, um, we are going to solve uh, y squared sine x is equal to the inverse tan of x minus y. So finding y prime here, we're just gonna trick this equation into spitting y prime out at us by just taking the derivative of both sides at the same time and seeing what happens. So I'm just gonna write that down again, easier for me to work off of it if I can see it in front of me. So we have y squared sine x tan uh, inverse of x minus y. All right, so here we go. The uh, left-hand side is a product rule. So again, I have chunk one and chunk two. And so the derivative of my first one is gonna be two y, but it's a function. So I have to treat y as a function. So if it just is some function of x that I'm unable to describe properly right now, uh, then I just say, well, leave the inside alone times the derivative of the inside. Technically to the power of one, I'm not gonna write it in, but I am going to say times the derivative of the inside, which would be y prime. Don't have a way to describe it, but y prime is good enough, or don't have a way to write down uh, explicitly yet. All right, uh, we are going to then multiply that by the second chunk left alone. I'm gonna finish off my product rule, so plus the y squared, and then the second derivative is actually uh, with respect, to, or the second function is written in terms of only x. So when I take the x derivative of that, I just get cosine x, and I don't need to really worry about how that's affected by doing it uh, implicitly. All right, the other side of my equation is going to give us the x derivative of the inverse tan of x. That's pretty straightforward, so it's one over one plus x squared. And uh, next up, we're just going to do minus the derivative of y. And the derivative of y is just the derivative of y, uh, y prime. So now that we have that done, we have y prime in two spots. So we have 2y, y prime sine x. Now I probably could have written that in a slightly different order. I'm not gonna worry about it now. Uh, plus y prime, I'm gonna bring the term with the y prime from the right over to the left. Uh, and then I'm going to take the stuff that does not have y prime in it and decide to move it all onto one side of my equation. Uh, so in this case, I have now uh, everything with a y prime on one side, everything without the y prime on the other side. I can then take my y prime that's here and here and treat it as a common factor. So we're gonna take that y prime, we're gonna move it out to the front and factor what's left, which is 2y sine x, um, and then plus one. Uh, so since y prime is the only thing that's a part of the second term, we're factoring it out and leaving us with a one. Uh, that's gonna be equal to what's on the other side of my equation. I'm not gonna bother messing with it at all. And then we will rearrange for y prime and get a really wonderful expression that's gonna look like this, one plus x squared <clears throat> minus y squared cosine x all over 2y sine x plus 1. Not going to bother doing anything with it. Um, again, we could probably run it through and uh, graph it and test this at a certain point to see if it actually seems to give us the right slope. Um, not too worried about it for the time being. Uh, hopefully that was helpful to you. Uh, and uh, hopefully you're staying safe. Take care, folks.